Hello, welcome to the New Testament Crumb Blog. I'm Hilary. We have been looking at the context of the angelic happening in Luke, and I'm hovering over the holy place and this task in hand. I noted that the chosen Zacharias is alone in there. He's focused on something that they would have considered an honour, a holy action in a holy place. And I feel to remind us of what that action was, going back to the original commandment about it. Moreover, you shall make an altar as a place for burning incense. This was a golden box with horns and carrying holders, a box that had a specific purpose, that the priest, originally Aaron, shall burn fragrant incense on it. He shall burn it every morning when he trims the lamps, when Aaron trims the lamps at twilight, he shall burn incense, and there will be perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. Now, Revelation 8 adds to the picture of what that means. This incense represented the prayers of all the saints. This context has taken us to a very special moment for this righteous man. We can picture him not just blindly obeying, because those kind of people were usually called hypocrites rather than righteous, but we can picture the holiness of this moment for him, the candlelight of the menorah, bouncing its reflection on the gold walls and the sculpted tables, and the unique aroma of the incense filling the air with particles, creating this golden smoke around him. He is chosen for this moment. And then an angel, not the angel of the Lord in this case, but an angel is suddenly standing there. The people are going to classify this happening as a vision, but the description of it doesn't necessarily indicate that it is a vision. It's more like this is a physical visitation that Zachariah is experiencing with his physical senses. Gabriel is the angel that appeared to Daniel, sent to give him insight with understanding. He's also the angel who will be sent to Mary. And here at the altar, where in times past Zacharias may well have prayed for a child, Gabriel has the news that the prayer is answered. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son. You will give him the name John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. But there's more, and this is where we would expect a priest, someone who knew the scriptures well, to just start to piece things together. He knew Isaiah's prophecy that one would come before the Messiah, before the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all flesh will see it together. A person who would be a voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. He would have heard Malachi's prophecy saying something similar but also talking of a kind of Elijah the prophet being sent before the coming of the Lord, and that this Elijah would restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their father. So even if he misses that pattern of older, barren people having really important spirit-filled children, it's surprising that he doesn't catch the references to this child as somebody who will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. It's he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit um, and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children. But then Zacharias is human. So even if there are lots of signs pointing to this, we can still understand his reaction of kind of unbelief. Now Mark is going to refer back to Isaiah's prophecy as well. Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness. And all four gospel writers agree with Mark, who wrote first that this baby was the prophesied messenger, the John who becomes John the Baptist. Matthew records Jesus clearing up any confusion about the reference to Elijah. When his disciples asked him, why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And he, Jesus, answers and says, Elijah is coming and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah already came, and they did not recognise him, but they did to him whatever they wished. 
so also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. And the disciples understood that he had spoken to them about John the Baptist. Now back with Zacharias, who is struggling to accept this is related to him. He says, how will I know this is for certain? For I'm an old man and my wife's advanced in years. Reminding us a bit of Sarah's response when she overheard the angel telling her husband Abraham something similar. Laughing to herself, saying, after I have become old, shall I have the pleasure, my Lord being so old also? And I'm remembering the Lord's response to Sarah's doubt. He didn't punish or inflict her. He simply told her he was listening, that he heard her, that he saw her. And when she denied it, however, saying, I did not laugh because she was rightly afraid, he said, no, but you did laugh. And we might think this is an incidental interaction, not really relevant to their story. But later, at the birth of her miracle son, Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And I think she was remembering, marking God's gentle response to her initial reaction of doubt as part of the story. Now I refer to this because as I try and read God the same as I experience him, the concept of Zachariah being struck mute as a punishment just doesn't quite sit right. I'm going to read it again. The angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day when these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. I've always read this as a kind of punishment, um, a kind of because you did not believe me, you will suffer. But what if it is the other angle, which would fit much more with the God that I experience? That because Zacharias is struggling to believe in this, God gives him his own personal and physical sign. And that's going to be with him every single day, that sign, until the baby is born. Every day when he wakes up and he can't speak, he remembers this incredible, holy interaction that he's had and that belief in the child and who the child is actually going to be, this forerunner for the Messiah, that faith is growing. He's going to need this level of impact if he's going to raise this extraordinary boy. And it's also going to help Elizabeth, I would think, as she experiences that miracle every day and learns of its purpose. Now, some folk refer to this five months of hiding as a kind of response to the favour that God is giving her, a reflection of her husband's muteness, if you like. After these days, Elizabeth, his wife, became pregnant and she kept herself in seclusion for five months, saying, this is the way the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked on me with favour to take away my disgrace among men. Now, that's going to probably be the rest of her pregnancy from when she first discovers that she is pregnant. That cultural shame of barrenness was now going to be over for her. Perhaps she just really wanted to savour this time. She's a righteous woman. She's a godly woman. And this is her holy place time, I think, when God is looking upon her personally. And the records are now going to turn to her young cousin Mary, of course, and I'm going to see you next time because there's much to glean more from Mary's story. I'll see you then.